Hello and welcome to the Henry Schein webinar series on COVID-19. I'm Dr. Gary Severance with Henry Schein, and today I'd like to acknowledge that this episode marks a full year of content and presentations related to the pandemic. We began this series on March 23rd, 2020, and certainly appreciate the many dental professionals that provided their expertise, and especially Dr. Resnick, who has become recognized around the world for his weekly editions. And a great thank you to the Team Shine members behind the scenes that record, produce, and deliver this webinar series. In this episode, Dr. Resnick will provide a clinical update and data from the latest ADA's Health Policy Institute. Additionally, Dr. Resnick will review in depth the current state of the COVID-19 vaccine in the United States and key insights to consider when you talk to your patients about the vaccine. Oh, and please pay particular attention to Dr. Resnick's message this week, as he'll be sharing a very special talent regarding the vaccine. Dr. Resnick, welcome. And welcome. It's always a pleasure to be back. I think this marks about a year that we've been having these COVID-19 and dentistry updates. And I'm actually pleased to say that today's update is going to be by far very positive. So having some positive news, some uplifting news is, I think, something important for our profession. It's something important for our families and our teams and, and those that we love and work with. So there is some information from the ADA's Health Policy Institute data that I'd like to go over. And what they found is that dental office's average patient volume has returned to about 81%. So it is slowly increasing of pre-pandemic levels. And staffing is at 99% of levels before the pandemic. If you noticed how the job uh, levels increased last week, a lot of that was based on travel and hospitality. So we're beginning to see see a little bit of normalcy return to our world, and I think that's really, truly important. What have been some of the dental impacts of this pandemic? Well, we know there's been a lot of preventive visits that have been missed. We know there's been a lot of work that's been put off, but we are have the technology, we have the infection control uh, protocols in place. We know that dental hygienists and dentists are very low when it comes to the percentage of our profession that has COVID that goes along with dental assistance too. But we've seen some dental manifestations. 71% increase in teeth grinding or clenching. There has been a lot of stress in our worlds. And so things that we would expect to see with stress, such as an increase in chipped teeth, an increase in, in cracked teeth, and even temporomandibular joint disorder um, uh, symptoms have really been on the increase. So we need to be able to address these, and we are able to address these. And by addressing some of these issues and getting our patients back into our preventive care, we'll be back up to 100% of pre-pandemic levels pretty soon. The polling data has, sort of gives us a barometer for how the pandemic stress is impacting our patients, and this is according again to the Health Policy Institute data. The increase over time suggests stress-related conditions have become substantially more prevalent since the onset of COVID-19. Remember, we had to shut down, we had to figure out how to work without doing aerosol-generating procedures, all those things that we're able to do now safely. Over the past month, the most common measure taken by dentists to maintain financial sustainability was raising fees. Others responded to the financial challenges of practice ownership by taking out loans, uh, by reducing dental team hours, and changing suppliers. I have been blessed. I've been able to keep my staff the entire time. Uh, we do have great pricing from the distributors that we work with. And as many of you know, I'm opening up a new uh, dental center in uh, the end of June of this year. Dentists in large group practices have had to take fewer measures to maintain financial sustainability compared to uh, family members or our colleagues that are in practicing solo. More than a third of dentists are practicing some form of teledentistry, and I'm actually getting ready to begin a teledentistry uh, project based on our program. Most commonly used for teledentistry is to triage emergencies, do post-op and follow-up care, and consults. It's also a great way to stay in communication with your patients. Approximately 10% of dentists who are enrolled as Medicaid providers 
prior to the COVID-19 pandemic have since disenrolled. And that is a little bit of discouraging news because there are many areas in our country where finding a Medicaid dental provider is a concern. And as even though I want to stay positive, we have to remember the story of Diamante Driver who was not able to find a Medicaid eligible, Medicaid uh, dentist. And so that is a concern. We're going to have to do work in the public health sector to try to get those numbers back up. Despite speculation that there might be some frequent mask wearing uh, impacts on dental health, that mask mouth, we really haven't seen it. The survey found no meaningful change in the prevalence of reported conditions such as bad breath, dry mouth compared to pre-pandemic levels. Consumer confidence in returning to the dental office hit a new high with 90% reporting to have already been back or ready to go. So it's us to up to up to us to make those statements to our patients. We've taken all these efforts. It's time to come back. Let's make sure that you realize you can't be healthy without oral health. So how many vaccinations have we seen in the United States so far? If you look at the percent of the total population that has received both doses, when we're talking about the two dose, either the Pfizer-BioNTech or the Moderna vaccine, um, receiving both doses as a part of our population is about 9%. If you look at the population greater than 18, which is the population we are actually vaccinating, we're about 12% of the general population in the United States. So we are making progress, but we have a long way to go. And a lot of that is really based on how the states are rolling out their vaccines, and, you know, what the requirements are. So we've opened up in Georgia for school teachers and for people that work in schools. And, and we're opening up for different, um, hopefully soon for different disease states. So we can address those that are most at risk. If you look at the vaccine type that's been distributed, you can see that it's very similar. There's been about 44 million or 45 million case of, of uh, Pfizer BioNTech's vaccine has been administered, and Moderna's is around 43 million. So we see a lot of this, and this data is before the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen uh, vaccine is available. Janssen is a, is a, a sub-company uh, sub within J&J, &J. so you might see both both names just to eliminate any confusion. One thing that's really encouraging, and I think it's very encouraging, is that there have been very few severe allergic reactions tied to the mRNA COVID vaccines. So again, Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech. Acute allergic reactions occurred in 2.1%, but anaphylaxis in only 0.025% of employees at two Boston hospitals who received the first two doses of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. The N number, the number of people that they studied, was close to 65,000 employees. 40% received Pfizer, 60% received Moderna. If you look at those who reported acute allergic reactions such as itching, rash, hives, swelling, or some respiratory symptoms, that was about 2.1% or about a little bit close to 1,400 people out of the total of close to 65,000. 16 workers were identified as having anaphylaxis. 63% had a history of allergy and 31% had a previous history of anaphylaxis. So we're seeing not as much anaphylaxis, but I'm sure if you had your vaccine, they made you sit and wait 15 minutes to make sure you didn't have an anaphylactic response. And that's how as dentists, when we're doing our vaccines, we should also participate and be prepared in case you have one of these very, very limited uh, incidents of anaphylaxis. Some stored states have reported a breakthrough in COVID-19 cases after the vaccine. Remember, none of these vaccines are 100% effective. As, as effective as our mRNA vaccines are, which is 94, 95%, people can break through. The two-week mark is important because that's how long after your second dose the body needs enough time to develop immunity. So it's not going to happen as soon as you get your second dose. It's not time to run out and do whatever. So, so far, the breakthrough cases have had only mild or no symptoms. Researchers expect some breakthrough cases because it's not 100% covered, and they're primarily focused on what symptoms people may have. 
Among 14 breakthrough cases identified in Minnesota, all were healthcare workers who tested positive during routine screening to work, all reported mild or no symptoms. As I mentioned, the Pfizer vaccine is 95% effective. That means that theoretically, out of 100 people who are vaccinated, five may not have the same level of response. Oregon has also reported a handful of breakthrough cases, according to their health authority. Um, four cases have been identified by mid-February and all had mild or no symptoms. This means get vaccinated. If you do have a breakthrough, it's going to be mild symptoms. Breakthrough cases provide a reminder for people to continue to take precautions. And we'll go over a little bit of what the CDC has recently said, but we still need to take precautions. We're still, we are improving. Things are getting better. Traffic is getting worse in Atlanta. I'm sure traffic is getting worse in your parts of the country. So we're seeing a beginnings of the recovery. And we really need to take our steps to make sure that we maintain this positive road to recovery. So let's talk a little bit about Janssen or J&J's COVID-19 vaccine. We know that on February 27th, the Food and Drug Administration did issue an EUA for the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. On the 28th, after a transparent, and these all of these research trials have been very transparent, where no one is trying to hide anything from anybody, um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice issued an interim recommendation for use of the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine in persons aged or 18 years or equal or older for the prevention of COVID-19. It has high efficacy associated with hospitalization and death. In other words, we're keeping people out of the hospital with the J&J &J vaccine, and we haven't seen any deaths for people that had J&J &J vaccine. And you know how many people have died in our country based on this um, epidemic. So do we choose what vaccine we want? No, get the first vaccine that is available for you. As you know, healthcare workers, for the most part, we've had mRNA vaccines because we're at 1A. But if you're offered the J&J &J and Janssen vaccine, it is met the requirements for emergency use authorization. It has good efficacy and it will keep people out of the hospital and most importantly, keep people alive. The Janssen uh, COVID-19 vaccine is a recombinant replication incompetent adenovirus stereotype 2006, 26. It's a vector vaccine encoding the stabilized prefusion spike glycoprotein of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Vaccination with the Janssen COVID-19 vaccine consists of a single dose, which for a lot of people is very important. If we look at people who are not showing up for the second dose, that's actually sort of important. So follow up. If you're giving vaccines, you're part of a, a group that's helping to give vaccines from the dental community, please make sure that people get that second appointment and they follow through. The Janssen COVID vaccine is not interchangeable with other vaccines. So if you've had one shot of one, don't go for a shot of a different kind. We really want you to stick with whatever vaccine you initially got as your second dose. If you've had no dose and they're offering you the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine, please move forward with that. ASIP does not state a product preference, so they're not going to say this vaccine is better than that vaccine. They're basically going to say this vaccine will work, this will keep you out of the hospital, this will keep you alive. Persons may receive any of the ASIP recommended COVID-19 vaccines are encouraged to receive the earliest vaccine available to you. I do have something here, which is states ranked by the percentage of COVID-19 vaccines administered. And this is from Becker's Hospital Review. So as of today, when I check, the top five states who have administered their vaccine, number one is Wisconsin, where the vaccines distributed to the state were close to 1,924,000, 1, and they have administered 1,804,000. So 93 or 94% of their vaccine has been in people's arms. Very excellent. Followed by New Mexico, North Dakota, Minnesota, and now Massachusetts has moved up into the top five. 
If you look at the bottom five, uh, the worst state that we have right now is Kansas, where they have only distributed 68% of their vaccine, followed by Alabama, Georgia, Alaska, and Arkansas. So if you look at this list, the top of the bottom five would be basically your 46th state. And my concern is it's based in the South and the Southeast, and these are areas that always are hit harder by disease states, whether it is hypertension, whether it is certain types of cancer, whether it's HIV disease. These states, with the exception of Alaska, tend to have higher numbers. So it's really important that the steps that we've taken in Georgia to now vaccinate teachers. I can't go home on the interstate without passing signs that say the mass vaccination sites are open. So we really need to help communicate to our patients the importance of getting vaccinated. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message regarding the vaccine. Vaccine, 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 vaccine. I'm begging you, please don't hesitate. Vaccine, 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 vaccine. Because once you're dead, that's a bit too late. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. So the ADA actually came out with a wonderful document on patient return about talking to your patients about getting the COVID-19 vaccine, whether your state is doing really well with distribution or your state isn't doing well with distribution. It's really the contact we have with folks that can help convince them in a scientific way to get vaccinated. So how do you start the conversation? When you're going over your medical history and you're seeing, is there any updates on your medical history, any changes in your medications, you can actually ask, have you been vaccinated? That's one of the things that you can do as a, a provider. Throughout the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, our folks, the dental team has put your health and safety first. We've taken extra steps to make sure that the virus won't spread in our environment. Now with the availability of COVID-19 vaccines, it gives us another important tool to keep each other healthy. Also to allow us to see our family, to see grandchildren if then, and, 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 to, and to start to return to normalcy. And we need to really emphasize that our concern is overall health. I've said it several times during the last year. You cannot be healthy without oral health. Well, now, as a part of your health care team, as a part of your primary care team, we really can talk to our patients about getting COVID-19 vaccines because, we, yes, we focus on their oral health, but we focus on their general health as well. Provide facts on vaccine safety and effectiveness. There's handouts that are very easy to find that you can give to your patients. People are more receptive to information if it's delivered by a trusted messenger. So get all members of the dental team involved. A lot of our patients truly trust and are really open with our dental hygiene colleagues. And so therefore, they need to have the information. They too need to be able to talk about this with their patients because they are trusted messengers. Your patients want to know what you think and may trust the information you share with them because it came from you. So it came from us. Consider sharing your own vaccination story. I got vaccinated the first shot. I really didn't notice much. Um, the second shot, and I did have the Pfizer vaccine, what I noticed was two things. I did have a very sore arm. When I rolled over it on the middle of the night, it woke me up. I also had a little bit of a histamine reaction, meaning that my nose was running, my eyes were red and teary, but I have a lot of different kinds of allergies and that sort of fit into what would happen for a little allergic response. I was fine. Um, I had it on a Friday. The next day I was supposed to take the day off. And to be frankly honest, the next day I put together two webinars. Yes, I was a little tired. Yes, I was a little sore. But on Saturdays at this part of my life, I'm usually a little tired and I'm usually a little sore. So I think sometimes sharing your stories with a patient and being honest will really truly help them um, and share the details that you had during your experience. It's important and very important to respect patient opinions because they'll vary and approach to the conversations have to be different. And always remember, a best way to communicate is with empathy. Try to put yourselves in the other person's shoes. Why may there be some hesitancy? What information can we share to help them overcome their hesitancy? 
people from all walks of life have different concerns about the virus and vaccinations in general. Um, so it's important to listen and realize there won't be a one size fit all. Some people have medical considerations, have a previous history of anaphylaxis and are very concerned about getting the vaccine. Others have religious beliefs or philosophical beliefs or other impacts where the, the health system isn't completely trusted. And so that's part of our job. They come to see us based on the work that we provide and the trust they have in us as a team. And so therefore we can help them understand and hopefully overcome any hesitancy about vaccines. Research from February 21 and the Associated Press poll indicated a third of U.S. adults are skeptical about getting the vaccine. That is a lot of people. If we want to get herd immunity, we need to do better. And so with factors such as a person's age, where they live, their levels of education, race, political affiliation, etc., impacting their decision-making process. When we're talking about vaccines, it's not our, our job to judge. It's our job to educate. As always, showing concern and respect for individual situations is essential. And that's basically what my practice has been based on these last 30 years, dealing with people who have HIV disease. Be prepared to that this might not be a one-shot deal, that when the patient comes back after their hygiene visit and they need some restorative work or possibly a, an implant or a crown, please be prepared to have the conversation again. You don't have to be nagging about it, but you really want to have the latest information. So when I put these presentations together, I put the, I actually, the morning of, I'm adding new information. So when the patient comes back two, three weeks later, you'll have additional information that will be able to be uh, helpful to helping overcome the, the barriers that we might see. Please make a note to check in with patients during the next visit to gauge how their perceptions may have changed. What are your thoughts now? Um, is there something I can do to help facilitate it? These are places that are doing mass vaccinations. This is that you now qualify. You might not be aware, but you now qualify to get vaccinated. Also, it's important to stress the importance of our infection control, that the vaccine protects the person who got it, but we still don't know if others who are vaccinated can spread the virus to others, which is why in my hospital, we still wear masks all the time. It's a wonderful opportunity to talk to our patients about what really matters for their health, their safety, and that's important. And also to stress that we're following these really strict and very special infection control procedures. I am so proud of our profession for one, doing such a good job at the beginning. I mean, we sacrificed at the beginning. We shut our practices down at the beginning, but we retooled them in a fashion that made a safest dental visit possible. And that was pretty remarkable. If we look at the number of dental hygienists who have been infected in dentists, it's around 3%, which is less than the general population. So what we're doing, we're doing correctly. Vaccinations will help with a much larger scale effort of stopping the spread of the pandemic. So we're taking care of what we do at our offices. We are taking care of our families. Let's take care of our communities. That's one of our biggest roles. Patient communication materials are important to make sure that you have either FDA or ADA or ADHA, uh, NDA, Hispanic Dental Association documents that will be beneficial to your patients about the information. Some of the information that you want to know, because people have some concerns. What type of vaccine am I getting? Is it going to change my DNA? How fast COVID-19 spreads? And we know that we have some variants that are out there that are spreading a little bit quicker, quickly. And how fast did the FDA get these things approved? I mean, this has been remarkably quick from approval to distribution. How did this all happen? So the type of vaccines being used that we've had so far are the mRNA vaccines. So let's talk about those first. Those are Pfizer and Moderna. The genetic sequence of COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, was widely available in January 2020, allowing scientists to rapidly develop vaccines. So we literally had the entire genetic sequence of the vaccine early in 2020. 
They began early clinical trials even before the virus reached pandemic levels. We didn't wait. They knew there was a problem, and the scientific world did not wait until the pandemic had really reached full level. Another advantage of mRNA vaccines is that there is no possibility that they contain live virus. There is no live virus in an mRNA vaccine. You cannot get COVID from an mRNA vaccine. It's very important to stress that because people who get the flu vaccine sometimes say, well, they gave me the flu. Well, you might have had a flu vaccine, didn't have enough time to develop the antibodies and we're, we're, we weren't masking at that period of time and ended up getting the flu. The vaccine does not, the flu vaccine does not have live virus. It could not give you the flu. It's the same way with COVID. And one of the things I think is remarkable, just from an observational point, the flu crisis that we see every year didn't happen this year. Why? Because we took so many important personal infection control measures. We took personal responsibility. We wore our mask when we went to the grocery store. We ate outside if we were going to be eating. We did a lot of takeout to support our local restaurants and communities. So we did a lot to protect ourselves. And what happened? No flu this year, which is really remarkable. How do mRNA vaccines work? Well, the mRNA vaccine tells your body how to make a spike protein found on the outside of the virus. Remember, that's what we're targeting, are, targeting are these spike proteins. Your body responds to that protein as an enemy and defends itself by producing antibodies. Antibodies are protein that attach to proteins on the outside of viruses. They coordinate the effort to eliminate the virus from your body. Then cells in your body remember that enemy, so they're trained and can produce these antibodies in the future if should you need them. The technology to create these mRNA vaccines didn't occur last year, didn't occur the year before. We've been studying this now for 10 years. If you look at the J&J &J or the Janssen recombinant vaccines, that's a little bit of a different kind of vaccine. It teaches your body how to fight the virus is similar to the way mRNA vaccines, but has a different starting point. Instead of injecting already produced mRNA into your system, the vaccine prompts your body to make the mRNA. So again, it's not live virus. You're not going to get COVID from the J&J &J vaccine, but it's going to teach your body how to make the mRNA um, uh, to, uh, on its own. So it's instead of just injecting the mRNA, now it's going to produce its own mRNA. The weakened virus, which includes DNA from the spike protein, not live virus, enters the cell nucleus. The cells respond by making mRNA for the spike protein. So again, this is not giving you COVID. This is creating something that is going to attack those spike proteins. From there, like the other COVID-19 vaccines, the spike protein exits the cell and stimulates the immune response. So we have two parts. Remember, we have the antibody formation, and then we have the T-cell response, which happens later. Both Pfizer and Moderna Phase three clinical trials, which began before the end of July, included 30 to 40,000 participants. This pandemic hit quickly, it hit fast. And so because it hit so fast, we were literally able to come up with vaccines that would help address it. J&J's phase three clinical trial began in September of 2020 and included over 40,000 participants. And they're actually, they did their study not just in the U.S., but they did it in South Africa and other places as well where some of those variants were. The clinical trials finished much more quickly than normal due to the quick spread of the virus and high infection rates. So we were literally able to have enough people to study this. Usually in other vaccine trials, there are so few infections, it takes longer to see if the vaccine will work. So then we're in this crisis situation. One of the advantages, I hate to say it, made developing the vaccines easier and made it faster. We have newer technology, we have existing technology, and we have the genome. How did the FDA and vaccine process work so fast? Well, you might have heard about the warp speed program from an earlier uh, webinar we've done or from something that you've read. The FDA review process for vaccine safety and efficacy was thorough and completely transparent. All of the data is online and available.
Typically, vaccine manufacturer does not begin until the receipt of an FDA approval. How, because of the warp speed initiative and because of the urgent need, our government ordered and paid for hundreds of millions of doses in advance. Even before we knew they worked, we were producing multiple millions of doses. This meant that the drug companies could ship doses of vaccine as soon as the FDA authorized it. So you may have heard recently that the president has authorized the United States to buy 100 million doses of the J&J vaccine recently. Some good news. The Pfizer BioNTech's coronavirus vaccine appears to be highly effective against a more contagious variant of the virus first discovered in Brazil, which is really causing a lot of concern in Brazil. And this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine this week. The study used blood samples from vaccinated individuals against an engineered version of the variant. The samples were taken from participants in Pfizer-BioNTech's late-stage clinical trials for the vaccine and were obtained between two to four weeks after they received the second dose. In the lab, the ability of the vaccine to neutralize the variant known as P1 was roughly equivalent to its impact on the original strain of the virus, meaning it's close to 94 to 95% effective. And our concern has been with these variants, will we need a booster, will these vaccines work? So this is very, very encouraging news that the Pfizer, and, and you'd have to assume the Moderna vaccine also, will protect against one of the most contagious variants that we have in, in, the, in the world. The vaccine had over 95% uh, efficacy rate, as I've mentioned, so we're really talking a significant finding here. There's also some new treatment news, which is on the positive side. The U.S. pharmaceutical company Merck, which actually is helping J&J produce vaccine, and to see two enormous pharmaceutical companies work together to produce has been really a remarkable uh, effort. But Merck, who's their, their, actually their vaccine didn't come through with good results, but they have developed an antiviral drug with Bridgeback Biotherapeutics, and it showed a quicker reduction in infectious virus in its phase 2A study amongst participants with early COVID-19. The secondary objective findings in the study was a quicker decrease in infectious virus among individuals with COVID-19 treated with this medication, and they said it's very promising. And so this is an oral medication. It's not an IV infusion. The antiviral is currently being tested in phase two, phase three trials, and it's set to be completed in May. Again, excellent news, and I'm, I'm really focusing on that in today's webinar. So we may have some treatments. We know the vaccines are there. We have some tools to help get our patients vaccinated. And what does all of this mean? Well, we do have released this week some interim public health recommendations for fully vaccinated people from the CDC. It's the first set of public health recommendations for fully vaccinated people. That means two weeks post J&J. That means two weeks post your second injection of either Moderna or Pfizer-BioNTech. The guidance will be updated and expanded based on the level of community spread, the proportion of the population that is fully vaccinated, and the rapidly evolving science around COVID-19. I thought the science around HIV went really quickly, to be frankly honest. The science around COVID-19 has been better than quick. It's been remarkable. For the purposes of this guidance, People are considered fully vaccinated for COVID-19 greater than or equal to two weeks after they have received their second dose of a two-dose series or greater than or equal to two weeks after they have received a single-dose vaccine. Currently, authorized vaccines in the U.S., as we have been discussing, are highly effective and protecting vaccinated people against symptomatic and severe disease. Present evidence suggests that fully vaccinated people are less likely to have asymptomatic infection and potentially less likely to transmit SARS-CoV-2 to others, which is, again, great news. How long vaccine protection lasts and how much vaccines protect against emerging variants are still under investigation. But as I just mentioned, we have some good news about the P1 um, variant that was initially discovered in, in Brazil. 
Until more is known and vaccination coverage increases, some prevention measures will continue to be necessary for all people, regardless of vaccination status. What can fully vaccinated people do? They can visit with other fully vaccinated people indoors without wearing a mask or physical distancing. You can hug your grandchild if you're fully vaccinated. You can have a small, intimate dinner party. Um, I've been redoing my house during the last year. I can have people over to come see it that I know are fully vaccinated. You can visit with unvaccinated people from a single household, and that's important. This is not bars, a single household who are at low risk for severe COVID-19 disease indoors without wearing a mask or physical distancing. Refrain from quarantine and testing following a known exposure to someone who is asymptomatic. So these are really important. So you can visit unvaccinated people if you're fully vaccinated in a single household who are at low risk, which means they're going to be younger. There means they don't have an underlying medical condition that might put them more at risk, etc. And I think it's also important that if you come in contact with someone who has asymptomatic disease, you do not need to quarantine any, quarantine any longer. For now, fully vaccinated people should continue to take precautions in public, like wearing a well-fitted mask and physical distancing. Wear masks, protective physical distancing, and adhere to other prevention measures, including hand washing, when visit with unvaccinated people who are increased risk for severe COVID-19 disease or who have an unvaccinated household member who as, is at an increased risk for COVID-19. So I'm calling it season since I'm approaching that age. I'm not calling it older any longer. So greater than 65, people who are pregnant and people with underlying medical conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or cancer. For now, fully vaccinated people should continue to wear masks, maintain physical distancing, and practice other prevention uh, measures. Avoid medium to large size in-person gatherings. Follow guidance issued by individual employers. Follow CDC and health department travel requirements, recommendations, and restrictions. So today has been more of an uplifting. We can now visit our family members. We can now do more, but we still need to remember that we are not over this pandemic yet. We have a ways to go, but we're making remarkable progress. As a dental profession, as I said, I could not be prouder of our profession for how we have adjusted to this pandemic, the steps we have taken to make sure we have the safest dental visit, and of course, um, protect our patients. Now we can talk to our patients about vaccines because you can't be healthy without oral health, and we want you to stay healthy. We don't want you to be hospitalized, and we don't want you to regretfully pass away. So remember that little song from Dolly Parton about vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. Um, it's never too late. Let's go ahead and get it so you'll be safe. Don't wait until you're passed away. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Gary and hope that everybody has a great week. Stay healthy, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Gary? Thank you, Dr. Resnick, and thank you for your vaccination message. As always, if you have any questions, concerns, or ideas for future content, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. And please subscribe to our Henry Shine YouTube page by clicking the subscribe button below. Until we see you again starting our second year of content, please stay safe and stay informed.